Well, welcome everyone uh, to our third Tic Tac show and tell. Um, it's great to have you all here. Um, and this session is going to be on empowering communities using geospatial technology, um, which sounds terribly niche, but um, it seems like so many people here are actually really excited and uh, interested in the subject. So we are we are thrilled to have you all with us. Um, I'm once again a really international audience as well, which is fantastic. Um, we've got a lot of really, really great uh, presentations, quite varied. Um, and as you know, if you've attended one of these show and tells before, they're very quick and snappy. Each presenter has only seven minutes um, to present. Uh, we do encourage you to ask your questions in the chat box, but in the interests of keeping the things tight and keeping things to time, getting this done within an hour, um, we are going to collect all those questions and our speakers will actually answer them offline um, within hopefully the next 24 hours or so, and we'll get those answers back out to you. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming along. Um, as you know, as many of you know, Tech Tech is our kind of event series that looks not just at what kind of civic tech is out there, um, but what the kind of impacts are and how it's actually really changing life um, for people around the world. For those of you that haven't been here to one of our events before, I'm um, Rebecca Rumble. I'm head of research at my society um, and me and Gemma who is the head of events and who you probably had many emails from about this. Uh, we've been running Tech Tech for six years now, I think nearly, um, which, is, which is quite exciting because it continues to go from strength to strength. We are still online, obviously, um, but we very much hope that we'll be able to connect with you all in person again very soon. Uh, we are desperate to do in real life events. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping, as you probably have been uh, made aware, um, the event's being recorded. Um, I've gone over the, the questions in the chat. Um, hashtags are still a thing. Uh, so if you're tweeting, please use the, the hashtag tick tech hashtag. Um, feel free to add to the collaborative notes that we've got going on. The link will be shared in the chat. Um, and we know that you know, after nearly 18 months of living on Zoom, it's very tedious to have your camera on all the time. We realize this, so we won't feel like it's rude if you want to turn your cameras off and just kind of sit back and, and take it all in uh, without having to look at your own little uh, little screenshot in the corner or anything. Uh, so that that's completely up to you. Um, thank you very much uh, to our speakers for, for submitting uh, the variety of presentations and for coming along today. Um, and without further ado, I will shut up and we will crack on. Um, so first up, we have Ben folks from DLib um, on Plantech and the geospatial ecosystem. So I will stop sharing my screen and Ben, over to you. Lovely. Thanks, Bex. And uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Lovely to uh, to talk to you um, this afternoon. So I'm going to endeavour to say really rather a lot in the space of seven minutes, which is a slightly crushing format, but I do understand the reasons for doing it. So oh, let's see how we get on. So uh, this afternoon, my talk is called Plantech and the Geospatial Ecosystem. And um, really what I'm here to talk about, because that is a fairly obscure title, is some um, some learnings uh, that we have uh, well found, really from uh, creating a new product. So for anyone that doesn't know, Delib is a digital democracy company that's around about 20, 20 years old. Now we work with a couple of hundred governments and public institutions, and our technology helps them to deliver public participation uh, projects um, of all types, so ongoing pub policy consultations, um, all the way through to things like call for evidence, local decision making around health, regulation, you name it, and our technology is probably used for it. And uh, everything that we've always done is a bit about making it easier for people to participate in these processes in the hope that by opening them up, you know, you're going to get better outcomes in the simplest um, sense. And really that's all I can probably say about that. And so um, we've been working on this stuff for, for quite a long time and, and the technology is fairly mature, but actually I wanna kick off by talking to you um, very quickly about land. So um, in terms of why we built this, product and kind of what we've learned it all really stems funny enough from from land itself so you know arguably land is is everything um i imagine quite a few of you are sat on a piece of it right now 
and actually land you know is more than more than just uh, the things that we're sat on it's it's a place it's a resource it's it's potentially our community and it's increasingly contested and the other t- tricky thing about land is that actually there's quite a lot of it and that does present a challenge if we are to to start to think about how we manage it and how we might bring people into decision making around that management and so you know funnily enough there are ways to help with that and maps really are kind of crucial to that and so i wanted to talk first about really maps themselves and what they might mean quite apart from in this in this context because maps clearly help us to, to navigate a place understand understand our relation to to it in the in the very real and very present sense but they're also potentially a way of understanding the past and also a way of envisaging potential new futures as well so they're potentially that sort of palimpsest of, of both states, which is, is quite interesting. But actually, if we're going to, to use um, maps to interpret land, it really becomes a question of, of why we might go about doing that. And it almost feels redundant to say it at this point, but quite clearly, depending on your point of view and whether you happen to be authoritarian or what have you, I think we can all agree that climate change is causing a few thorny issues and we really do need to address them. And apart from climate change, clearly there are other massive drivers to change around land use all around the world, whether it's you know poverty, pandemic, post-pandemic, if you're lucky enough to be in, in the right place. And so what we have is a massive set of drivers, um, you know, and an increasingly contested world, I suppose, in the largest sense, and also a real need to, to involve people around future decisions. And so we're already seeing a huge amount of this activity happening from our customers over the last couple of years. Um, and so it quickly became apparent that we needed to act upon that and to actually to, to find ways that we could incorporate maps. And really what I mean by that is geospatial technologies into public participation um, technologies and, and at scale as well. And so it really becomes a question when you do look into the technologies and, and wanting to, to, to kind of address some of these things as to, to the things that you're looking to, to help overcome. A lot of technology, whether you want to call it user needs, it really does come down to, to problems. And so what we did was we went out and uh, interviewed around about 30 government organizations, largely in the in the Northern Hemisphere. And we wanted to know how they actually needed and wanted to use geospatial technologies in these in these processes. And we kind of suspected straight away that saying, well, people need to put a pin on a map is not a terribly good starting point for, for design. And so we went in and we looked and we asked, well, what are the processes you're running here? And we chose some deliberately quite difficult ones and technical ones, say in the UK, formal local gov- um, planning ones, sorry, local government planning um, processes. And apart from, from those interviews and what we'd already seen, it was, it was pretty obvious that the barriers here and the thing you need to address with geospatial technologies to make things better for, for users and by extension communities is to, to get through some really basic stuff, you know, like mapping technologies that do exist, they're not accessible, so large chunks of, uh, of an audience can't take part. Most of them are ridiculously rudimentary. Most of them don't allow you to get any meaning from the data. So what's the point of collecting lat and long if you can't do anything with it? It's just an engagement exercise. We don't need any more of those, quite frankly. And then there's all sorts of hideous things that involve paper and what you might colloquially term a shit ton of admin. And so as with all of these technologies, they have to work for both parties. So a lot of barriers, but also barriers that if you can overcome them, they're really going to solve the problem for, for both users. Those public officials and those people trying to take part in decisions um, that probably are going to uh, impact upon their lives. So lots of barriers, lots of research and development. I forgot I made this slide, which is a pity. It's rather attractive, yellow on yellow. Yeah, I don't like it at all, actually. But anyway, what uh, quickly becomes apparent is if you want to incorporate geospatial technologies in um, in these kind of processes, it isn't sufficient, as we, as we thought and suspected, to simply allow people to put a pin on a map and produce an export. Actually, you need to design and facilitate the whole thing for both parties. And that really is the kind of key learning around this. Either do geospatial well or don't do it at all, frankly, would be my recommendation. If you are going to do it at all, there's quite a lot that you need to build. So in end-to-end, we had to build um, and support the ability for users to, to add maps to a web page. Way harder, you might think, if you're not using Google. So we had to get involved with using Ordnance Survey and OpenStreetMap props to both of those providers. You need to uh, give people control about the Zoom, and then you also need to allow them to pull in data to overlay on those maps to inform people better in these kind of processes, as is usual. You need to find interesting ways, or rather correct ways, that people can interact with those challenges posed. 
So if you are going to talk about, let's say, sea level rises and the impact on a community that's living on a floodplain, and you're worried about how they move around it, we really need to understand a route across that piece of land rather than simply a point, which is largely meaningless. You also need to find ways, which I don't have time to explain, for public officials to get meaning from that data. So suddenly you're into the world of basically GIS systems. And then finally, the other opportunity around this is to make exercises more coherent. So you need to find ways for data to be used in feedback. So feeding back those outcomes around decisions and also reusing them potentially in later decision-making cycles. So geospatial, a world of opportunities, many, many drivers, very difficult to do. But we've had a gate and the product has just launched what's next because the time has just gone wrong we're putting out to users we'd expect about 50 organizations to be using it by next year and that represents many thousands of admins in uh, in the hands uh yeah in public institutions essentially so it could be very interesting next year i've gone over time by about 10 seconds it's tough all right seven minutes don't work let's accept it there we go thanks for listening <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. Um, you were you were, only, yeah, you were only about ten seconds over, so we'll give you that. That's not a problem. Um, the reason we are doing these as uh, very condensed uh, talks is because I think a lot of us are quite uh, are, are quite bored of lengthy presentations over Zoom at this point. So snappy seven minutes, uh, as we think, is uh, the way forward at the moment right, uh, to make sure we can cover lots of content. <laughs> Being read. I do apologise. It does make sense. No one likes the base speakers. <laughs> uh, but you know, Ben, if you are lucky, I will plug you the the podcast that D Lib do uh, later on. <laughs> um, fantastic. Okay, thank you so much for that, Ben. That was super interesting. And we are on uh, to our next speaker. Um, I've lost my notes. Sorry, this is uh, this is not a live. Uh, sorry, this is not a live presentation. Um, I sure I stress that um, is with us. Um, but this is actually a recorded video um, that she's provided for us, um, just in case the uh, the internet wasn't quite up to scratch. Um, so this is from Kathmandu Living Labs, and uh, this is looking at the effects of open street mapping on the mapping themselves. So please take it away. If I say that about 7 million people around the world are being affected by a certain something, but we don't know what exactly these effects are, isn't that feeling a little unsettling? That's exactly the case of OpenStreetMap. We know it's amazing, we know it helps us, we know there are a lot of people involved, but we don't exactly know how it affects the people working on it. Hi, I'm Aisharya Shrestha. I'm a research assistant at Kathmandu Living Labs, and today my presentation will talk about our exploration into the effect of mapping in OpenStreetMap on its mappers. So Kathmandu Living Labs is a leading civic tech company that has trained and engaged thousands of people in mapping their local communities in OpenStreetMap. Our post-disaster response after the 2015 Nepal earthquake is still recognized as one of the most successful use cases of open mapping in disaster response so far. As a social enterprise, we provide data and technology to benefit the society. This research is conducted under the Pure Science Project, is funded by USAID and is managed by National Academy of Sciences with scientific input from the US National Science Foundation. We started this project back in December of 2016 to understand the phenomenon of open mapping. We use action research methodology to generate scientific knowledge while expanding mapping. We have a small core research team. We have Namaraj Puratuki, who is also our principal investigator. He's the founder of Kathmandu Living Labs and is a director of humanitarian OpenStreetMap Asia Hub. We have Nancy Erbstein, who is our US partner. She's also a professor at the University of California, Davis. We have Chitis Khanal, who is our former research assistant. He is currently a PhD student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Apart from us, each and every member of KLL have more or less been involved in this research. In simple terms, OpenStreetMap is just like any other regular map, except that it is open source and the data is crowdsourced. The crowd of OSM has been successful to form a community, an ecosystem of its own. This community currently has more than 7 million registered members who are directly or indirectly affected by OSM. This number 
also makes it one of the largest volunteer geographic information projects in the world. Within the OSM community, these people contribute in multiple ways. They edit maps, they onboard newcomers, they develop applications. However, within the OSM community, these activities, specifically OSM mapping, is tied to humanitarian causes and is mostly regarded as a form of volunteer service. However, recent studies hint that the experience of mapping could actually be as important as if not more, as the data that is contributed. From here, I'll stem our curiosity. We began to ask, what are actually the effects of open street mapping on the mappers? For our study, we chose this youth mapping internship, digital internship and leadership program. We chose this program for its inclusiveness in terms of academia, gender, and the locations that the participants came from. We had a total sample size of 40 mappers. The mappers were trained in person for four days, after which they mapped rural Nepal for three months. During this internship, they wrote blogs and after the completion, wrote a report. These reports and blogs were analyzed to inform our findings of the immediate effects of OSM mapping. Here, we found multifaceted effects irrespective of differences in gender or academia or professional backgrounds. Our first finding was effective learning, which comprises of learning related to learners' personal feelings, attitudes, perceptions, and emotions. Mapping is such a phenomenon that even one person can contribute data that can create huge impact. Mappers note exactly that. They realize their individual power to bring a change and hence develop self-efficacy. For example, Akriti here notes that her experience of mapping helped her better understand the incredible reach of just one person's contribution in OSM. Similarly, as mappers map, they're also inclined towards OSM ranking. Here, Nima says that the day he was ranked top mapper of Nepal was one of the happiest days of his life. Similarly, mappers also develop a sense of identity towards being a part of OSM community. Akriti says that the most immediate outcome of the whole mapping internship for her was being recognized as a mapper in the OSM world community. Next, our finding was technical skills and digital literacy, which was kind of given. Since OSM mapping is a technical process and the mappers are continuously involved in it, evidently they develop an improvement in the technical skills and digital literacy. Sri Krishna here says that as he was mapping, he got more handier, more comfortable with open source softwares. Next was cognitive skills. We had not seen this coming. Mappers reported that as they were mapping, they were learning decision making, critical thinking, analytical thinking, spatial thinking as they were mapping. So Abhishek here says that as he was mapping, he was developing critical thinking. He was being aware of the subjectivity of data. So this might be in part because of all the inquisitive process of OSM mapping. Dakshita says that as she was mapping, she started looking around and noticing places that she probably would have ignored earlier. Our next finding was geography-based knowledge. So when mapping, mappers notice the different geographical features and structures and relate the lives of people living there. For Ashmita, mapping was like getting a virtual tour of different parts of Nepal, which helped her to visualize the different living environment of people and their access to various infrastructures. Similarly, mappers also developed their knowledge of the use of maps. Here, Sri Krishna says that he learned about the usefulness of maps in terms of governance and infrastructure and disaster preparedness. Professional skill building was another possibility. The mappers, all the way from different academic background, could relate their academia with OSM. For example, Akansha with crisis management, Dakshata with architecture, Abhishek with disaster management and sustainable development. To conclude, we noticed multiple skills like effective, technical, cognitive, geography-based, professional, different skills developed by OSM. However, there's still a huge scope of investigation and undoubtedly other categories of benefits that are yet to be identified. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ashbora. That was really interesting. And I think it was really nice actually to, to sort of reflect on 
the positives um, that, that people participating in this kind of civic tech um, get out of the process um, and how easy it is actually sometimes to, to actually bring about change. Um, I think we all know uh, the science that says, you know, if, if you can see that you've made a change, you're probably more likely to, to make effort to do so in the future. Um, and yeah, really great to, to see that evidence uh, happening in Nepal. So thank you very much. And thank you also for uh, putting together the video at such last notice, uh, late minute notice as well, um, just in case. So thank you very much. Uh, moving on, uh, we now have Nadia Babinska from Open Up Ukraine, um, talking about open data for local self-governance, learnings from five Ukrainian cities. So, over to you. Thank you. I will share my screen and I have my seven minutes. So let's go. Uh, yeah, my name is Nadia. I'm from Ukraine um, and uh, I want to share my experience as project manager of uh, geospatial systems development for uh, Ukrainian cities and how uh, we managed to a bit combat corruption and establish efficient efficient government governance there uh, using geospatial data and geoinformation systems and uh, to start uh, to start I want to share like the basic uh, the basic explanation of what does it mean geospatial uh, systems geospatial data is uh, something that um computer based uh that helps for example if you're talking about government to collect store and an analyze and visualize spatial data because our government they have plenty of information about objects about something which is you can um uh, this, uh, you, you can identify as uh, uh, special and to understand the uh, geo-system uh, infrastructure we have to understand for example if you work with government what kind of technical equipment does government, local government, for example, have? If people are working there, what kind of competencies they have? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, institutional capacity they have? We also have to understand what kind of data do they have, like initial data, raw data, whether it's good or bad quality, accuracy of the, this data, completeness of this data. We have also understand how the, the business processes are working in government, what kind of adopted and uh, working in in government amendments needed or new legislation is needed for uh, building good uh, GIS infrastructure and we also have to have some technical equipment uh, and we have some some software uh, maintaining and implementing geoinformation systems so we work with five cities is like they're from different parts of Ukraine with different cities with different data quality like servers, so some of them, they didn't have any servers for um, uh, implementation of special information systems. Some of them had GIS specialists that could uh, like develop some uh, layers for, for GIS. Some had not, not, no people for doing that uh, or have some minor uh, qualified specialists. Some of them, they already had some geo portals, but it was mostly just for publishing data. Uh, we mean uh, by GIS is not only to publish data, but also to have all registers uh, um, led in this uh, geo information system. Uh, so we uh, we worked on five main uh, data uh, layers and data sets. It's about investment proposals, communal property, land cadastre, advertising plans, and uh, we also worked on budget because it's something that can we can uh, um, identify uh, with just special data. And uh, what kind of uh, approach we uh, chose is first of all is to understand what kind of capacity does uh, each uh, government has uh, have. For example, uh, why do they need this geoinformation? System. For example, if we're talking about communal property, maybe it's for um, making this um, property uh, be governed more efficient and uh, uh, increase tax uh, income from tax uh, taxes on this uh, property. We also uh, worked together with, with local government to create uh, terms of reference for equipment uh, procurement and for software development, because in some cities we had to buy some servers or some computers for them to uh, sustain and maintain geoinformation system infrastructure. We also um, 
worked on software development, tested it, and we chose a test development, um, test driven development approach that we developed some piece of software and we tried to test it together with local council to local government to not make sound, to not make changes at the end. And we also, as I told you, we also worked a lot on legislation to uh, to uh, make uh, to settle all the changes of the business processes inside the government on legal basis that uh, for example, uh, local officials, they uh, have to work in these joint information systems uh, according to the legislation, not because it's like somebody's will. What kind of problems have we faced during the implementation of the project? It's that there is lack of or no data infrastructure on the local level. If you're talking about national level, it somehow can, can be, but on the local level, it's really hard with data and understanding what do they need data. Many uh, registers are on the paper, uh, very low level of um, data culture in general uh, a lot of resistance of course because what does it mean your information system is that you not only can uh, for example understand about the for example communal property but you can go according to the geospatial data and see whether it's communal property there and what kind of state of this communal property for example or how much how much uh, budget money were allocated for this communal property so a lot of resistance where we got something new it's something uh, complicated then uh, it uh, uh, people used to work with it's about also corruption in governmental it uh, it means that many Many people like to buy uh, some software from the, their people and to get some cash back for that. And when you come to the city and propose some open source software, for example, and with low level of uh, payments for uh, development, they just they don't like it because they they are used to work in uh, in this uh, uh, playground and they also um, like to play for time. It means that they are just yeah we'll do it we'll do it, but at the end they do nothing and it causes a lot of uh, nerves and tension to uh, to make them work. But in any case, in uh, like it takes us almost half a year, and we finally we developed uh, geo portals and geo information systems for a local government. And we, for example, I show you one of our geo portals. It's for the Tomer City Council. So you have access here to map, and you can uh, uh, see all layers on uh, on the map, and you can also see. Um, data sets, you have access to data sets via API and these data sets are integrated with different open registers in uh, Ukraine and you can also combine uh, combine different layers to see, for example, how, how much uh, money allocated to different um, other uh, objects and layers. So, and we created this uh, ecosystem for, uh, for further development of uh, transparency and uh, openness of Ukrainian cities. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. And yeah, it looks like a really great tool. And I'm sure lots of people on this call will uh, have experienced some of those themes you talked about dealing with government uh, as well. Um, so yeah, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, moving on now to our fourth presentation. Um, we now have Janet Chapman of Tanzania Development Trust, uh, Crowd to Map. Uh, talking about digital champions, community-led development monitoring in Tanzania. So, Janet, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm the chair of Tanzania Development Trust, which is a volunteer-run um, charity that's been working with grassroots organisations in rural Tanzania for the last 45 years. Um, and these are our priorities. And um, about five and a half years ago, um, I realized that the fact that rural Tanzania was really poorly mapped was a huge issue. So I started crowd to map which is a volunteer run mapping project that has over 16,000 online volunteers mapping into OpenStreetMap for community development, but also to help protect girls from female genital mutilation, which is an issue in certain parts of Tanzania. So we're working with FGM activists um, like uh, Hope for Girls and Women um, who are doing outreach work and um, protecting girls from FGM, particularly during cutting seasons. Um, most 
of um, much of rural Tanzania looked like the map at the top um, in Google Maps, but also in OpenStreetMap, which is what we're using. There's been a lot of mapping um, that's taken place in urban areas such as Dar es Salaam, particularly around flood resilience um, and also access to healthcare. But much of rural Tanzania still looks like the map um, at the top. So we are mapping into OpenStreetMap, um, working with um, activists on the ground, um, youth mapper chapters, um, but also remote mappers. So if anyone's interested in, in helping us, please do get in touch. So we're um, tracing roads and buildings from satellite images, um, as you can see here. And then people on the ground in Tanzania are adding their local knowledge, such as the names of places and so on, um, using um, various tools, particularly um, maps.me, which is a free app. Um, we're also, where we can, we're um, adding open data, such as um, school and clinic locations into OSM. So here you can see some volunteer mappers adding um, their local water point. And we've been training activists and the police to use um, downloaded maps on maps.me to very quickly um, rescue girls at risk of FGM. So particularly during the cutting season, they will get a phone call in the middle of the night saying girls are about to be cut at Bancha Bancha village. Um, there's no street maps, the, there's no street lighting. And it was very difficult for them to get to this precise location quickly, particularly at night. So using something like maps.me um, with the map data that we've added was really useful. And we estimate that that over 3,000 girls have been rescued from, um, prevented from being cut this way. Um, we also set up a network of digital champions in each village. So they were selected by the village as um, they were somebody who was part of the Women and Ch Children's Protection Committee. They'd never used a smartphone before, they'd never been online. So uh, we've trained them into using a smartphone, mapping their village but also reporting gender-based violence using a free app called ODK. Um, so here people are looking at a map of their village for the first time and working out what still needs to be added. Um, and there's a lot more information about these digital champions um, on our websites if you're interested. Um, so they had training um, on various ways of using their phones and how to use um, ODK in Swahili. Um, so they had some in-person training, but also ongoing training because there's basically no budget for this um, via WhatsApp groups and so on. And now they're getting involved in um, more general monitoring of progress towards the sustainable development goals. So um, they're involved in a re research project, which um, is looking at access to health um, on a village level. So these are some of um, the pharmacies that are available in the villages where they are, um, because we believe that the SDGs are best implemented when they, uh, we have data village by village, etc. So we've started a project this year in Matari village. Um, so on open data day in March, we had a session um, where people were, were um, we had a discussion around the SDGs and um, which were the most relevant to their community. Um, the things that particularly came up were access to healthcare, clean water and better roads because the roads are very poor. Um, and then the idea now is that going forwards we will, we will um, do a sample every six months um, to, to track progress. So that's a quick overview of our project. As I said, it's an entirely volunteer um, project. Um, anyone can help who's got an internet connection. So if you'd like to join us, um, please get in touch um, and I will send you more details and it will be great to get people's advice. Thank you. And Stanit, thank you so much. That's um, an incredible, incredible project. And I think everyone uh, here can agree that it's a, a fantastic initiative. 
um, and yeah, very, very humbling. I think I can, I can remember the mapping situation not being great the last time in Tanzania, but uh, shamefully, I was only looking for a karaoke bar. Um, you know, this project is really, really worthwhile. So great to see that going on. And yes, encourage anyone interested to, to get in touch and offer their services. Uh, we have one last presentation now um, from Peter Kemp, um, planning at the Greater London Authority um, on visualising the future, how 3D imaging helps residents understand the proposed changes. So over to you, Peter. Um, I don't think I can actually follow some of those presentations, um, in particular the Tanzania one. I think that actually a lot of the work that we do is um, not quite as impactful. So. Um, I'm really sorry if this is a bit of a, a, a downer at the end. Um, that being said, I, the, the subject I wanted to talk on was some of the work we're doing around playing with 3D data to try and unlock the potential for London. Um, and the, the principle here being how we engage Londoners in the planning system. I always try and include this slide at, at, the, at the, uh, the, the start just to kind of highlight that our involvement in, in the digitization of the planning system in the UK is for a number of reasons, um, including around business process, and resident engagement, and, and actually trying to monitor what's changing so that we can use these as levers to increase delivery. So, so why, why is this challenge so, so dramatic? Well, um, pre-coronavirus, in practice, um, we were about as populated in London as we have been at any time in history, rapidly heading towards 9 million people um, in the Greater London area, and that excludes quite a lot of the suburbs um, and some of the small towns around it. So we've got quite a challenge and um, with growing city, how to house all these people and how to use a planning system in a way that engages people in the decisions um, that, they, that they, they make. So at the moment, the planning system um, kind of hides a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to engage with a planning application. Um, I just thought I'd take a snapshot of one here. Um, I didn't deal with the application. I used to live a few doors down from it. Um, but, but you kind of have to have quite a lot of technical knowledge before you can realistically engage with understanding how a development affects you. So first of all, you need to be able to understand how to access data. Secondly, what that data really means. And then thirdly, how that do, do some form of visualization in your own mind and to try and work out how it might affect you. And that's quite a long journey to go on for an individual just trying to access the planning system and trying to, to control the environment they live in. But it's not just individuals like you and I, um, we also have elected members in here as well that, that are being forced to make some quite complex decisions um, with very limited understanding of, of, of a, of a two-dimensional plan and how to model that in your mind. Just to touch on other digital platforms for a moment, because as, as always, when you move into a digital space, um, the transfer, as we're starting to discover, of visitors to any digital platform to actually making any meaningful comments on, on a development proposal is shockingly low, 6%. That's 6% of the people that could be bothered to look at a platform before they even decide whether they want to make any comment on it. And that was with quite a lot of our intervention to get them to make comments. So we can see that the, the, the system in itself doesn't work. Um, a lot of people argue that the planning system is broken. I actually argue that the planning system could just be better as could all things. So the, the space we're working in is slightly more complex. Um, we, the use case for moving the planning system in London to a 3D um, environment is actually threefold um, and each one builds on their own. Um, we have taken the view that residents sit at the heart of the use case. Residents' involvement in the planning system is, is one of our biggest drivers to, be, to, to play in this space. But secondly, um, that then informs decisions we can make. Um, so we, we need this data set to really drive that. And then thirdly, that will drive innovation. So 
to build this theory, we put, put out one of the proposals for, for the Civic Innovation Challenge, which is a challenge that's funded and supported by the Social Tech Trust and Microsoft, and then fronted by the Mayor of London. It's a really interesting space to work in because SMEs get the opportunity to, to, to do all sorts of things. The successful, gosh, that's really blurry. I didn't realize the resolution was so poor. The successful um, party um, in the challenge would put forward a proposal as to, to how we use 3D data in, in an open source platform in a way that might enable residents to be able to access it and use it. Now, that was just the very start of the journey. And I put this image up here because we played with it in a num number of different ways in the process of building the platform. But 3D Repo were the successful people and they, they developed an open source platform that enables users to put their own data on there. Um, and then we went on a journey about what that really meant in terms of the user interface. So in an ideal world, we had this model that would enable people to wander around, stand on their balconies, um, have, a, have a look at it for the scheme from any particular angle. You've all seen a lot of these fly through and exciting things. But when we went to build it, and this is where I discover, there we go, we have got to play. Um, we, we discovered we, that that was too much for a lot of users. A lot of users were really struggling with, with this interface where they could actually do lots of things. So we started to develop an interface that enables users, uh, enables the party consulting to take users on a journey and ask them questions about specific aspects of development proposals. And this in itself we've been testing has been really achieving different responses because that 6% actually don't go any further on the journey unless they've already answered something. So that percentage increases dramatically. Um, oh, this is where we discover my screens broke, freezes at this point. That's really clever, isn't it? Um, but, but there's a number, I'm going to have to stop sharing and reshare. There we go. That's a bit clever of me. Um, but there's a number of really important learning points that we have from here, um, which I will try and very quickly share. And I'm sure you'll forgive me 10 seconds extra. Um, what have we learned? Well, first of all, in, in the digital space, um, we've learned that residents aren't necessarily ready for digital by default. Um, and then in testing, expect some really bizarre outcomes. Um, we, one of the big outcomes was um, one of our users tried to test using a Raspberry Pi. I didn't realize people still used them. Um, secondly, around users, um, they, they, they all liked all these fly through things, but actually a, a resounding response was very much that people wanted to stand on the street and experience a development as they actually would experience it. They weren't interested in this high level thing. And then developers wanted real certainty as to, as to the accuracy because they were concerned that as users could theoretically stand on their balconies, they can actually understand a development in a different way. And that might trigger different responses. There was other really kind of interesting things around tech um, and we, we had to think about multiple ways of addressing issues. Um, but more importantly, um, our argument is about the future, which is about the future needs to really focus on open source technology in this space and open data, which leads on to our, our next big steps around procuring open data for London, because it will then achieve a lot of that innovation space that we're trying to get into. So there we go, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Peter. That's a very uh, big job, I think, reforming, uh, reforming the planning system. And whilst I think you are very right, you know, your mum, our mums should be able to use this tech. I think we need to be very careful these days because all of our mums have learned to use Zoom and or everything else on the internet <laughs> over the last year. So goodness knows what we're letting ourselves in for. Um, but brilliant. Thank you, all, uh, all of our speakers. Um, Lots of really, really interesting presentations, very varied, very geographically uh, diverse. Um, so yeah, thank you to, to Ben folks from Doolib. 
uh, Ishbora Shrestha from Kathmandu Living Labs, Nadia Babinska from Open Up Ukraine, Janet Chapman from Tanzania Development Trust, Yun Chen from Gov.Zero, um, and Peter Kemp from Planning at the Greater London Authority. Um, really, really appreciate you taking your time uh, to share some of your work with us and the wider Tech Tech community. Um, I know we've got various different questions that have been put on the chat, so we'll be forwarding them around to you uh, very shortly. Um, we will hopefully be able to, to send out your answers to all of our delegates here uh, within a couple of days. Um, I think someone asked about the, rec the availability of the recording on the chat. Yes, we will be making that available again, hopefully towards the end of the week. Um, I think that's everything we've managed to keep to time. In fact, we, ha we are four minutes uh, in the green. So well done to everyone. Thank you for, for keeping to time. Um, I think all there is for, for us to say is, uh, yeah, thank you all for attending. Uh, we really appreciate it. We will be running another series of uh, events in the autumn. Um, so look out for those on our Twitter feed. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much. And we hope to see you again soon.